Hey, yo, welcome back. And hey, I've seen you before, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were you here yesterday? Feels like only yesterday we did this. We <laughs> go from like like two week sort of sabbaticals to mm. just pumping them out. One yesterday, and then we'll do two today. <laughs> <laughs> I know what's wrong with us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. So you just might have heard that voice on over the phone from there. Um, let's give him a little quick intro from that. So he owns Strikeforce Gym that has like such <coughs> such great champion, uh, such great fighters at the moment, like very hot at my Jaden Enlund. Enlund, um, yeah. Enlund, yep. Um, and it was also uh, Jay, uh, James Honey. Yep. As well. James Honey's on awesome, fire. Awesome, awesome, yep. and some awesome great legends as well, which we'll get into soon. We have uh, Mark Pease on the on the line. How are you today, sir? I'm very well, thank you, guys. I'm and yourselves. Oh, good. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah beautiful great. weather down here in, in Sydney town. Uh, long weekend. Well, not much to complain yeah, about. Yeah, well, long weekend. Yeah, not good weather up here. Mate. It's overcast and looks like it's going to rain in the Gold Coast. So uh, you're in the better place, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a rare switch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, look, Mark, first time on the podcast. And um, how about you just tell, like, a bit of your backstory uh, for our listeners that might not know you from this. So, like, you know, style, like, you know, how did you get into martial arts? How did you get into Muay Thai? And how, how did you progress from there? Uh, well, I've always done karate since I was about five or six years of age. My father did it uh, back in the early, early days of Bob Jones. Um, and uh, I went to a fight show with one of my old karate instructors. I think it was around about 16 or 17 at the time. Um, what's the guy called Tony Quinn fight? It was a kickboxing fight. I think I'm pretty sure he fought um, one of the Patterson, Gary Patterson, I think. Oh. Um, and he's a knight from a long time ago. Um, and I said, well, I really enjoy what I saw, you know, in the square ring and, um, asked my instructor, he said, man, I can't teach to that. So being young and stupid and naive, we decided that we'd go and do it ourselves as an 88. So I was still doing karate and, um, uh, myself and a young guy called Stephen Roston, another guy called Matt Bowell, started, uh, we just do, do some own backyard kickboxing things ourselves um and that was really about it so that's where it started from in 88 and we started doing um mat tournaments um in yeah, late 88 and then 89 started getting some good quality fights and then 1990 it sort of went progressed and i got a guy from wa that moved over mark simpson who's one of wa's number one ref still today um, he comes from a strong boxing background and I, I was more of a kicker. So we sort of combined our talents together and we started getting some really good fights quite quickly. And uh, we sort of, it just virtually took off from there. And then that was probably 1991. And as you all probably know, way back then, it was a raw thing. You'd, you'd go to a fight venue and you'd um, get weighed in and they'd say, Look, come back in an hour, we'll see how you go, how many fights you had, and wait and say 61, 63. They said, all right. Come back in an hour, they would say, okay, there's someone here, 65, he's had about as many fights as you. What do you reckon? So that was it. You either took it or you went home. So that was the raw old days. It progressed quite nicely from there to, you know, then they'd say, okay, we've got a fight for you. And in, in probably 93, 94, it got a lot better. There's a lot more, you know, three or four more promoters. Uh, Blair Moore starting to bring ties over. And and then we decided that we'd go to Thailand. So it sort of, the tie itself didn't really structure us till probably late 1991 but when the ties come over in 1993 that's when we really thought far out this is this is for us we need to do a lot more we need to go there to learn so yeah. all pan from there ah nice so when you <clears throat> when you made your own trip to thailand uh what were your initial thoughts and experiences and uh, where did you go Oh, uh, initial thoughts. Okay. <laughs> we went with a guy called Tim Dharmajeeva, who's a gentleman that owns Sit Songkinong in um, Bangkok. Now, he took us up country, myself and a, a couple of mates, to up near Kanchanaburi uh, onto a sugarcane plantation. Now, the gym was called uh, Tairungria. I'm not sure if Stephen's still there, but it was, they all had kids. And he said, this is where all, you know, so everyone learns the basics from here. It was, you know, like when I'm talking, uh, a horrible looking old gym. It was concrete. The windows, there was no windows. It was barred. Uh, people looking in because it was a sugar plant. So the bag had dents from everyone. If you didn't kick the dent, you got sore shins. And that's how we learned. And we learned to skip quite frequently for a couple of days before he would even, even look at us. And it went on from there. So Tyrungli was first and then a small little gym 
in uh, Bangkok called Premchai, and then uh, Tim had a lot to do then with uh, Fairtex because uh, he was managing it at the time, and that was probably around about 96, 97, when we started going there. But we also started going to Koh Samui with Stephen Fox because uh, Stephen Fox was um, running tours from there, and like Koh Samui was dirt right. It was not like it is today. It, you know, there was very few Westerners there. Uh, especially in Bangkok, it was a lot of, um, you know, there's a few Dutch people there, obviously Raymond Deckers, Hippolytes and guys like that. Um, we were a little bit before Wayne, so Wayne Parr, that is. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, I, we weren't treated the best, but we weren't treated like <laughs> because, because, you know, they, they didn't really know Westerners at all, and we, we sort of tapped into their sport. Now, Damien Meyer, I'm not sure if you remember Damien Meyer from WA, he was a pioneer. He was going over there to sit your time with Bob Jones. So we all started blending. We all sort of knew who we were and we'd go to the same sort of gym. So uh, in, in Patea, it was sit your in, in, um For us, uh, in the early days, it was Tairungria and, and then to Fairtex. And then it all started branching out from there. So, you know, I think in the early 90s, it was good for us because um, – you didn't know what you were going to get. Um, and, and nowadays it's a lot different. You know, most of the trainers can speak uh, relatively good English or Dutch or German or whatever they speak sometimes as well. But back then is if you, you got used to sign language and uh, uh, this, that, and that was a bad So it was hard. It was, I'm not going to lie, it was hard, but you either did it or you packed up and went home. And, uh, mm. you know, sometimes we'd go for eight weeks, we'd go at 12 weeks. Uh, and But in that time, you know, it, but for us back then, 12 weeks was a long time because no one would speak English. No one could, and we couldn't speak a great deal of Thai. So, you know, you either did it the hard way, got on with it, and, or you, as I said, packed up and went home. So simple. And how long have you spent in Thailand all up then, roughly? Oh, mate, like on and off, and not as much as some of those other boys. Man, those guys spent years there, you know, but I had business coming here as well. So, I had, you know, I, I'd do a, a month here or six weeks there and up to eight weeks, ten weeks. So, I don't know, over the, uh, I, I would say 60, 70 trips, somewhere in that vicinity. It, it maybe it could even be more. Um, right. And then we got, in the late 90s, we sort of hooked up with uh, Eminent Air, which we yeah. still got very good friends today. Um, our um, good friend, uh, Meow Charavan, he's yeah. from there, so... We would bring him here for three months to our gym, and then I'd send Aaron Lee or Pixie, uh, and then Nugget would send Oren. So we had a really good rapport going to this one gym because we liked what they did. It was really, really, you know, it, it was very few Westerners back then, as I said, still, you know, in, in the mid to late 90s even. So it was good then. It's a bit different now. <laughs> yeah. And you kind of mentioned that sort of your start was going from that kind of karate background to seeing what yeah. was kind of more so full contact, but still kickboxing and then getting that more, like you wanted something, I suppose, a little bit more real tends to be kind of the story. Well, yeah. Okay. Yep. Back when we were doing the kickboxing, we, we didn't really know um, other than what we saw because yep. it, it was all above the weight, as you all know. It yep. was still in the ring and all that stuff. And then Bob Jones came and stayed at my house, um, uh, I think about 80, late 89. Uh, Mark Simpson was there as well. And he just done, done their first tour to uh, Sitchitong. And he was just talking, you know, for three days at my house. And we were training and doing leg kicks and knees. And, this, and we, were, we were sold. But he sold it to us, you know, like he sold it to everybody. Yeah. You know what I mean? And to be honest with you, he's the pioneer and the godfather of the Muay Thai coming to Australia without a doubt. Now, I know Pon did his thing as well, but they all sort of, we, we all know each other quite well and all friendly and, um, and, and still to this day, all, all good friends, you know what I mean? But Bob Jones, to me, he, he, he sold it to us up here in Queensland and from then on, it was, I just said, no, we're not doing anything else other than this. I mean, I like the shorts, I, I like the leg kicks, you know, and the clinch. I mean, we were raw at it, we did our own things and then we started getting, you know, back because we felt better and, and VC, remember those things, VCRs? You put a tape in and you play. You guys might not remember that stuff, eh? I remember. But anyway, we, we before my time. Yeah, well, Dan, <laughs> we got tapes as well with Danny Jones and Dave Sook Jai, and we would um just watch the fights, and you know I'd be picking things out of it, and Tommy'd be picking things out of it, and we'd start to train with that sort of stuff because there was really nobody here that we could train with other than we when we go to Thailand and and trained ourselves. 
know, because there was no real coaches. And then WA started bringing in coaches in, in the mid night, like no ties and lots of stuff. And they were staying for a year, two years, three years. So the sport really started to adapt here quite strong, especially the late 90s to the early and, and mid 2000s, man. We had, like, I'm talking not just Queensland, I'm talking Australia wide. Mm-hmm. We had some phenomenal high fighters and that, that could compete worldwide, you know? Yeah. And I guess um, always my question, uh, I'm always fascinated to hear from kind of like uh, people that were involved in that sort of like pioneering period such as yourself yeah. in kind of coming yeah. from what was more so a kickboxing kind of um, background and then getting getting that experience up front of going across to Thailand, I guess, what were the main areas um, of things that could, cause you'd kind of more so been involved with kickboxing and then you'd started to see yeah. Muay Thai and then to go and like experience it firsthand, I guess, what were the main kind of eye opening things that you saw from going there? Like, okay, that's something that we don't really understand back home. Oh, clinching. 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 Well, that, look, I, I was always told that you know, a lot of people can kick and punch quite good as we all know, but a, a really good tie fighter was really someone that was good in the club. You could you could see them. They'd do sweeps and good knees and pull a hand, parry a hand down, drop an elbow, and you'd be thinking, "Hang on, we got no idea." But like, the, um, you know, not everybody, but predominantly a lot of the Australian uh, clinching is very, very, really, really close, and it's forced, and it's, it looks like a struggle. It looks like a more of a wrestling match than anything else. But then you get some really good gyms out there that, that now I'm talking about. Not back then; it was raw back for us then. Now you've got people that are good in the clinch and they had a look at lock a guard, lock a head, foot sweep when somebody makes a move and, you know, and they put parry hand down, drop an elbow in. That's what I like to see. I like to watch a good chess match with Muay Thai yeah. and love it. You know? And that's what I, I felt back then. It's We really lacked, you know, one, we lacked the power and the kicks and the punches. You know, we all thought we were superstars back then. You know, after 12 fights, you go there and you meet someone who rings out 250 fights and you think, what? 250 fights? <laughs> Fights, you know, and he gets belted, you know, and they'll go, oh, who was he? Was he a champion? Oh, no, he was just somebody that's had 250 fights. He was never at the main stadiums and things. So we learnt the hard way and but sort of paved the way for the newer people to understand that, you know, don't just go in and put your hand out to do any fight against somebody that you've got no idea about, you know. It's, you know, it's it's more of a... um. You know, way of life for them at stuff is that, you know, it was like you go and do a bit of a tour, learn a few things. Oh, we'll go and do, a, we'll have a bar fight or we'll go and do a stadium fight up country. You go up country and you're thinking, you know, these guys have never even been to Bangkok. Some of them, and you think, oh, can you? He's always had 75 fights. But they, you knew that they wouldn't even weigh you. They just grab your arm and your stomach, your legs, and they go, okay, you, you match him. You think, hey, okay. And you wouldn't know if he had one, 10, or 400 fights. So yeah. that was a good thing. Now thing, oh look, they still do it a little bit, but mate, that's all now. It's all weight in, you know, it's all done. You know, you got Max Muay Thai and mm. Thai fights. They're a lot different now. Everything's done a lot more efficiently. And, but I feel that's more catered towards the Western and, and the European in, um, clientele. Yeah, mm, definitely. S- speaking of which, yeah. like, um, I remember, like, you know, when I was first started, like, watching. Muay Thai, like, you know, my first experience like watching Muay Thai, Muay Thai was like through Fox, yeah. like, you know, the evolution shows and that yeah. as well. And like, I was a huge TS2 <laughs> fan, Aaron, Aaron Lee fan, major, major big fan. <laughs> um, so yeah. like, can you talk us through about those early beginnings? And it's almost like, I guess, like it was a golden era for Australian mm-hmm. Muay Thai then as well. Like, you know, what was the scene like there? How did it build up and like, you know, <clears throat> and like, um, going today, like, uh, like, yeah, what's the differences? Okay, well, back then, so Aaron was in the mid '90s as well. Um, so he came in, but it was funny because Brian Murphy and Scott Bannon, as you probably both know who that, those gentlemen are, yeah, yeah. they you know the fights. He, he they said this kid's going to be a world champion. You know, like he was just a very natural athlete. He was a sponsored surfer, and he was just very good at what he did. He did karate, again come from a karate background as well. He just had that. I don't know, he was brash, he was cocky, but didn't care. You know, it's like he was walking around at 48 to 50 kilos and he'd be sparring guys like Pixie, who was 65, 66, or Danny Didassi, who was early 70s, and, and he would spar them like he was their weight, you know, and you're thinking, man, who's this kid, you know? But it was really, but I said before, you know, Australia-wide, we had a really good pool of fighters back then, you know, like Daniel Dawson, Darren Reese, 
50 par, you know, Corbett, you know. I mean, I could give you a, a list of probably about 50 blokes yeah. that were good. Same in my you know, Kuravik, Blair Smith, you know. I mean, the list goes on, you know, and, and up here as well, Nugget, Soren, Craig Hogan, Humpty. It's just we did have a – we were very, very lucky – uh, back then, to have such a pooled talent. And, you know, like Nugget and I still have a really good, close uh, working relationship and friendship, you know. Like, we've known each other 30 years, but, you know, like our boys have all fought each other. But after the fight, some of the, you know, people are going, Matt's some of the best fighters I've ever seen, but they're good friends still, you know, like mm. Pixie and Humpty. Pixie and Humpty, they're always at each other's weddings and funeral and they come to our parties and all that sort of stuff. Summer and I as well, you know, Nugget and I still talk, you know. So I think back then it was a little bit different. I'm not, you know, there was no, again, the social media aspect uh, sort of came in. I, I feel, it, look, it made it good, but it also made it a little bit, um, in my opinion, a little bit bad because people were sort of trolling people and stuff, you know, he's had this many fights. But yeah. he didn't care. You got to, trained for a fight and you fought him or you didn't fight. And, and back then, the, the, you know, like I had Warren Shaw promotion. Uh, there was um, the Fight World Cup uh, explosion with Raymat Samura. There was Evolution. There were some really good promotions going around, but we did it in a, in a way that was like one every three three months. So people sort of look forward to, oh, it's not another show for another three months type thing. Mm-hmm. So everyone had but, and you know, we all had great crowds and there was great fights and not every time that, you know, each, you know, my guys or next guys got on the same show. So they had to train hard to make sure they were in with the showing for it. So yeah. it was a lot different. Um, nowadays, as you all know, there's a lot more promotions and so forth. Um, yeah, look, I'll, I'll put it out there. I don't feel... Um, not all. There's still some really very good, hard, strong fighters out there today that still have that old school values, and I love it. But you know, now some of them have, you know, they've got a mind coach, um, a dietitian, a sports and, I'm oh, sorry, strength and conditioning coach. Um, after three fights, I'm thinking, whoa, after three fights, you know, and I just feel it's lost its uh, way a little bit. I think they're putting, a lot of people putting too much pressure on themselves. Obviously, you know, for the social media accounts. I mean, not everybody. I mean, so please don't you know, get me wrong on that. There's, but there is a few people out there that, that do that. Um, and, uh, you know, if it works for them, it works for them. You know, they, they may you know, maybe to get sponsors on board and help them out with their training fees and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, after three fights, man, like, I, I can remember when I, after three fights, man, all I wanted to do was have, have, have a beer, have, you know, ice machines and lay down for a while. That was what I wanted to do. Right? Oh, yeah. Bit different. Bit different. I mean, like I said, like, I had uh, a couple of cash converter stores up to, uh, with a few other guys up to probably six or seven years ago. And I started seeing that the, the sport was evolving quite a lot. And it did evolve. Um, one, because of, of the social media sort of aspect. And because a lot more people started getting involved. It started not just about guys anymore. You're getting females that wanted to train, young kids that wanted to train. So it became a little bit harder. So I decided I sold out of my businesses and I went back to, I did a um, Bachelor of Sports Coaching at the University of Queensland to understand athletes better on a sporting psychology side of things because I had a little example. I had a fighter that was fighting and he was doing really well in the fight until about the fourth round and got a bit of a touch-up. So I sort of, not abusive, but I got very, very much in his face in the corner trying to re-motivate him. And he slowed right down. And I thought, what? At the end of the fight, he goes, what did you do that to me for? He says, I was getting belted there. And then you go into ver- verbally. I said, what? So I sort of thought, well, if I don't start evolving with the newer athlete, I'm going to lose a lot of people. So now, as I said, after the you know, three years of university, and that, I walked out with, as a Bachelor of Sports Coaching. And what I liked it is now we put, I've got a fighter program for each fighter um, that comes to my gym. That's why we quite lucky so all my coaches know that I get a sheet and I get to the fighter and it t- talks about things like you know what motivates them you know what you know what their goals are for a year three year and five years and what their weaknesses are what they think their strengths are and how they like to be spoken to by a coach so then I formulate a plan from looking at all that to try and get their weaknesses to strength and help them to get to their goals and know how I need to speak to them in the corner without getting too over the top and that way then we start working on a board so my coaches know that, okay, with such and such fighter, we need to work on 
this aspect, this aspect, and this aspect. Even if I don't have me, they'll have somebody else like Malcolm or Darren or, or Brent and holding pants or wherever. So that way then we're sort of all on the same path. And it seems to be working so far pretty good. So I'm not saying it's a bees all end all, but it, you know, I'm, I'm accountable for each and every person that walks in my gym that pays me a, a good money to uh, get that. Um, you know, to get them to where they've uh, chosen to get to. So, and as we all know, you don't play Muay Thai. It, it's a dangerous sport, mate. You, you can get damaged, and you know, in some cases, you can bring it permanently damaged or even die. So, if you're not doing it correctly, so I, I think everyone should choose the right coach. You know, be smart, choose the right coach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, yeah, if, if, if you kind of look at like how you used to train uh, fighters to, like, you know. Obviously, when you yeah. when did uh, did your uh, did the university degree from there? Um, yeah, is, is is that mainly like the the main changes you saw saw in your coaching philosophies? Uh, yeah, look, no, no, I, I still train them the same way on the pads and the bags and all that sort of stuff. But just giving uh, each individual fighter a program so that I know what we need to work on with that fighter, rather than saying, okay, you do five rounds, you do five rounds in the bag. Now, if you got thirty people in your gym and you've only got three coaches, it gets a bit hard to sort of get that little bit of interpersonal uh, relationship working. So yeah. when I understand what makes my fighter tick, what what they like, what they don't like, how they like to be spoken to, what motivates them. I can use those things as a plus for training so that way I don't have to keep looking at them all the time. So the pad-wise and all that stuff, you still, you know, you critique and things like that. But it was more to do with probably uh, the psychological side, the emotional intelligence, getting to know my fighter, what makes them work, what makes them, you know, what they like, don't like, what colours they like, you know, what they like to eat, you know. Just so they make, oh, shit, he is taking a bit of a vet that interests me. I can get the best out of them or yeah. her. Yeah, and and off of learning that, I suppose, like as you start to kind of uh, personalize your approach on a, a fighter by fighter basis, yep. I suppose as yep. you, as you're getting that tailored approach per fighter, uh, you, you mentioned yep. that you kind of find out how they like to be spoken to and stuff like that. How much of that do yep. you gain from just kind of asking them, and how much of it is because, of course, like when you ask someone. How would you like to be spoken to in a corner? They might have an idea in their head of how they like to be, but then there's also kind of the – it might be different to what actually works in practice, I suppose. So, like, what's the it's balance funny. between understanding what they want from them and then yeah. just figuring out what they want from do, – do you try different things? Like, how does that kind of process work? Yeah, look, it's funny you say that because that's why I give them the sheet of paper so they can – I said, have a really good think about this. When you write down these answers, I said, make sure it's coming from your heart and your head, not just go, oh, I want to be stuck to do like this. Mm. I said, because if I get to a corner, and I've seen that, you know, the majority of them, when I say, how do you like to be stuck and do in the corner, all say the same thing. Uh, and that's every fighter from Corey Still to Natalie Pavlidis, Jaden, James, Anthony Pap, all of them say the same thing. Speak to me in a way that needs to be done. Mm-hmm. So that uh, so you can interpret that any way you like. So I, yeah. I, I feel that they've done that, I need to get into their face a little bit and give them that little bit, let's go. We need to start digging a little bit deeper. You've told me you want to be this fighter, you're not showing me this. Okay, so, but I, but I do it in a way, I don't sort of, I don't demoralise them, I just do it in a way that I have to dig deep. You can look deep inside you. You've told me you want to do this, I'm not seeing that. So I'm just sort of putting it back to their court rather than on my court. So if I am start yelling at them, you go, you're yeah, not doing it the way we've been training for... And I've seen, I've seen guys, I mean, you guys would have seen it too. I've seen guys slap people in the corner, throw water on them in the corner, and you think, if I, I'm not going to respond to that, <laughs> you know? And, and, you know, I mean, like, I think a lot of fighters, a lot of coaches now are starting to see that, that this is the way forward because, you know, back in, like, back in, like, from about 2008 back into the 90s, you could get away with getting the fighter's ear and really give it to him and you get a result nine times out of ten mm-hmm. nowadays you can't people are a bit more sensitive sometimes, now <laughs> yeah, they are sensitive you know some, and, and sometimes you've got young kids you know like yeah. and I'm little kids uh, you know eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve year old kids and then females as well but sometimes the females are probably a little bit I feel sometimes the females are a little bit stronger mentally yeah. than a lot of the guys. Uh, and, you know, I've got some uh, pretty strong female fighters uh, or have coached some pretty strong female fighters. And it, I feel that I, you know, I, I can say, once we start talking and I understand how they work, 
I can then start, you know, I know in my heart how far I can push them before it gets a little bit too, not abusive, but too over assertive. Mm-hmm. And then they get a response back, you know. And, and as I said, most times I get that response that I want. Yeah, I think it's fair because it's like um, at the moment from there, just your gym's like one of the strongest gyms in Australia at the yeah. moment in terms of like, you know, the, the fighters you're producing and, <clears throat> and the fights you're Thanks. taking. Yeah. Oh, look, it's not just me. I've got a pretty good um, coaching team there. And, you know, with Darren Freiberg, Malcolm Maxwell, Brent Simpson who comes down, Haddock and Prack, uh, we've got a really good team. But the, what, what's good about our team is everybody, if the fighters aren't fighting, they'll hold pads as well. But they'll give to the lesser fight, you know, the guys that had two, three, four, five fights and they'll work with them, give them their spin on things, you know. So I really, I'm really big on the, um, the, one, the humility in the gym and, and the respect. And, but, you know, there's no ego. Look, don't get me wrong, we all have our little egos and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But it's more point that, um, that these guys will pass their knowledge on because, I mean, what I teach is sometimes a little bit different to what somebody else is going to teach. But as long as it's all panned into the same area and they're working on the aspects that we need to work on, it's fine. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, looking at a couple of recent fights that some of you guys have had from there, it's like, because, like, just, yep. especially, like, let's say, Jaden's last one where he had, was at the Prince Promotions mm. from there. Like, yeah. um, yeah. How, how do you approach something like that? Like, you know, like, potentially the fight three times in one night. Um, like, yeah, ha- yep. how would a training schedule, like, or how would you, like, you know, plan something to, to work out like that? Uh, Jaden's a different egg. Jaden's a human being that trains probably eight hours a day anyway. Um, he, he trains, he coaches people, but you know, you can just see by his physique. The guy does train a lot and that's all it's on his mind 24 seven training, training, fighting, training. So it's pretty easy to work with somebody like that. Yeah. He knows what to do. I mean, pad rounds we need to work with. He needs his strength and conditioning stuff. Um, he does rounds, he does his clinching work, but, but, but being in a, as we all know, in a super four, it depends what injuries you cop, mm-hmm. you know, like he First fight he had was with Michael Bedard. I thought, oh god, of all people to get first up, we get we get him, you know, because but, and my, Michael's no, you know, Michael's a, a good fighter. I mean, yeah, I rated nice Michael much. quite. A lot. He's fought a couple of my boys before and, and uh, put them away quite quickly. So I was, I was a little bit not necessarily worried because Jaden's a pretty big boy, but I just thought that like if if Jaden kept moving and not standing still, he'd be do well, well against him. But then, you know. Michael started spinning, and then Jaden started spinning techniques. I'm thinking, oh my God, what's going on here? But, but in saying that, he didn't get any injuries from it, which was good. Yeah. So he just kept his he kept his work rate up really, really highly. But going into the second fight, that was a different story because the guy that he put in the zone, he was a big hitter because he yeah. fought Guy Coleman and he dropped Guy Coleman quite comfortably. And I thought, oh, this is going to be hard. So we just sort of had a look at this plan, but. Everything that we said went straight out the window because old mate came and he had bad intentions in every shot that he threw, every kick, every punch, and his crowd. So the crowd sort of helped him along quite a bit. And I thought, man, this is going to be a tough war. This is going to be a war, you know. Mm -hmm. We get through this, it's going to be very, very, it's going to be different to the first fight. So, but as you probably saw, they both, old mate, he he kept throwing, he could lead with a jab, but Jaden would always try and throw an overhand at him, Mm -hmm. but he wouldn't duck his. And then they the went to the corner and he's pressed Jaden with a jab. He threw an overhand. Jaden threw an overhand, but Jaden moved his head. He came in straight, and it just it was a it was a, actually it was a very hard knockout to watch because it, it was a pretty bad looking knockout. Oh, that was <laughs> brutal. That was brutal. Yeah, yeah. There was even you know, and like I didn't know what to do. I thought, geez, hang on, this guy's knocked it. Now he folded at the knees quite comfortably. Yeah, and I thought, oh. I felt sorry for him, but you know he he came with the, the right attitude that he wanted to press, and he did what he wanted to do. So, it, you know, had he gone to the full distance, I think Jaden. I mean, I, I still think he would have won, but I feel he would have been a lot poorer than what he was going into the last fight. Yeah, and that, that KO was so brutal, and and I think like I I, I was there. I, I've rewatched it since. I actually don't yeah. think like how br- like it obviously comes across as a brutal KO when you watch the stream but I don't think you can fully appreciate that one if you weren't in the venue watching that like well we could hear Paul Dem- yeah Paul Demicoli screamed it when he hit him that hard like I Paul Demicoli was probably about a good 20 meters away from him yeah the noise that he made from that knock it was yeah you, you were there man it was a brutal knockout yeah. it was 
you know, I don't like seeing things like that because at times you think, shit, I'm going to be all right, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and Nick Carris gave me the thumbs up from over the other corner. So that, that was a good thing to know, you know. It yeah. was a, a little bit daunting at first, but, you know, geez, you know, some, and if old mate hadn't come in so hard, it probably wouldn't have gone like that. But yeah. he just wanted, he really wanted to assert the authority. But, you know, we know it is. Like, he had his home crowd there, yeah. so the adrenaline better of him. He probably doesn't normally fight like that. He probably does fight a lot more composed, but he just wanted to, it was all kill or be killed type thing. Yeah. And unfortunately, that case, he was one that got um, put down. Just that's, that's the game, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Live by the sword, die by the sword. Yeah. It is exactly right, mate. You, yeah. you can't put it any plainer than that. That's the game. You make a mistake, you're going to get caught for it. It's not like tennis. You make a mistake, it's 15 love. If you make a mistake, you're out like you're, you know, you're out on your feet or you're out, on, out cold. Yeah. <laughs> Which um, set up, of course, in the final. I'd imagine, I think the top two seeds in that tournament were Jaden and Charlie, um, who, yeah. who had fought before. So what's yeah. it, what's yeah. it like as a trainer? You've kind of, of course, in an eight man setting, you can't prepare for any one person. You don't know what the draw is going to be. Yeah. But I think a lot of people kind of tip them, if not to see yeah. each other earlier in the final. What's it like as a trainer to then take your boy to the back and be like, okay, we've yeah. now after two fights, we're going to fight one of the yeah. top guys in the country that we've had a pretty hard loss yeah. against before. Well, what's that process like yeah. as a trainer? Well, it's funny because we were sitting in the same change room together because, like, Danny Mac and Charlie and all of us, we're all, all mates. Yeah. So, Jaden and him were talking. And talking about. So, it was, uh, not, in a normal situation, I'd say I'd be out there trying to motivate, let's get it on. We, you, know, you, you know, this is what happened last time. But this time we have to do it differently. Um, I think that all went out the window. I, I think Jaden was, he was more than willing to just do the fight, to see the fight through. Uh, and do it comfortably. And it was a good fight, you know. Like, you know, he, he wore everything Charlie threw at him. Mm-hmm. He stood there toe to toe. Didn't, he didn't excel himself. But in seeing that, I knew he had an injury as well because he got a banged up shin. Charlie had a banged up foot. So to me, it, it didn't really showcase the best of what those guys could do. I think if they had it all out, because Paul Dickey came up and said, look, they're both eruption fighters. They both fight with elbows. Let's yeah. go to the final with elbows. And Prince goes, mate, we're in the elbows. They like kickbox. They don't like kickboxing. I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. You know? so, <laughs> and you can't change the rules of a tournament while it's on. <laughs> I, I, it didn't eventuate, but, um, you know, yeah, I was, it, it is what it is. I mean, Charlie's, you know, the best at, at his game in, in mm. the country at that weight. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Good to see. Him. It was good to see that Jaden got through, and you know, I, I think he broke a mental hurdle against Charlie. So they're possibly down the track. There may be another fight later on uh, with those boys. But again, like I said, we're all mates now as well. So it, it does at times get a little bit harder. But yeah. those guys, you know, they're there to compete. So they'll put on a show and then go have a drink afterwards together. You know what I mean? So that's what it is. That, that's yeah. the fight game. <laughs> that's what I like. You know, you get your friendships. You know, I've got friendships from this sport from all over the country and all over the world with guys that you know you don't see for a, a year, two years, sometimes three or four years, and then you walk back in like you haven't been apart from each other. You know, and yeah. that's, that's the good thing about. It. That's what I. But you can't do that with a lot of other sports. This is this is a sport. You know, you, you know people say, "Oh, you're doing well, PZ." You, know, you, you know, so are you Blair. You know, or Donny Miller, you're doing well, mate. You know, or Andy Parnham, you're doing well. You know, like PZ. You know. It's, it's it's really good that this it's it's banter, but it's also paying the respect to, to each other, um, and you know, knowing you know we're all the same thing. You know, we're running gyms, we're running businesses. You know, promotion wise, gym wise, tournament wise, whatever, and we're all all for the same goal. So, you know, it's it's my passion is your guys' passion as well. I mean, I I love it. You know, I mean, like Shane, you came to when I had Damien Trainer. Like we've known mm. each other probably 20 years, you know, he fought Aaron on one of my War on the Shore show where Aaron won the Commonwealth title against him, but we've stayed close. We've gone to Hong Kong together. We've gone to Japan together with when him and Aaron were fighting and all that. So, and I, he said, mate, I'm, doing, I'm coming to do seminars. Can I do it? I said, mate, 100%, come to my gym, you know? And it was really good. It was sort of more like, you know, again, like I said, hadn't seen each other in probably, that state probably six or seven years. And it was like, we picked up where we left off type thing. And that's why I really enjoyed this sport. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good seminar. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Yeah, (laughs) I got a lot from it. It was a good seminar. (laughs) 
Um, so we've got a, got a couple more things to touch on. So so we've mentioned a few names um, as we've come across here of kind of your current crop of fighters. Um, you guys yeah. are always well represented on Eruption, which is coming up. Um, I watched James Honey rematch Matt Smith the yeah. other week, and I thought that was yeah. unreal. James Honey's a guy that I've been talking about a lot as I think he's very experienced, but I think he's really just coming into his own now um, in the way that we watch him yeah. fight. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of... Um, the Viking athlete as well. Just give us a little bit of a yeah. run through of who's got fights coming up. Who who are the ones to watch from Strike Force? Yeah, just just your take on uh, that side. I'd I, I say all of them, mate, because we've got quite a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've got yeah, uh, eruption. We've got uh, obviously uh, Natalie Pavlidis. Yeah. We've got Brittany going down to her real weight of fifty-seven kilos. Fight yeah. Amanda Juniku. A war for those two girls. Both those guys. Cool. I rate both girls. Uh, Natalie and Nicole, that's another fight that's, you know, both girls again, you know, they come to fight. Uh, and that's the good thing about them. Uh, James Honey and Jay Thomas, that, that's a really hard fight for James, but, it, you know, I feel now James needs to start stepping up because, um, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, Matt Smith is a really good fighter, but he beat him in 2019 quite comfortably, but he actually picked his game up this fight. We had to change a little bit in about round three for James to start getting... Uh, the results we wanted, and, he, and James adapted quite well to the, to the changes we made in round three, which was good. So, um, they got Jade Nienod fighting um, Guy Coleman, and then there's a possible... Yeah, so they looked at... And then, who else we got? Then, um, well, Taylor Doherty going to town sort of fight for a Queensland title up there. So, and then Anthony Pappas fighting uh, Zach Innocent on Rose. Yeah, Rogue. that's a good fight. I'm a big fan yeah. of um, Pappas' style. He's, he's very nice to watch. Yeah, he's good as well. So, like, I mean, I don't really sort of like to say that one, I mean, it's our group, you know. Yeah. So we all sort of go and help each other. And it's, look, there's a lot of good fighters, and they all bring different attributes to, to the game, every one of them, you know. James has got a really good tie technique, as uh, Jaden's just powerful, but good technique, where Natalie Pavlidis has just got a will, just strong will, you know. So they've all yeah everyone's got their own little niches what they do and they all help each other you know like when we do you know clinching and butch all night on Fridays you know you can see them that it's just it's such a competitive edge against each other they're all trying to get it over and that's what I really really like about it you know they sort of but in saying that they sort of you know they sort of try and keep things under wraps, but you can just see that that little competitive edge oh man I can get you I'm going to do this and you know so but you know, if I said at the present stage who's the ones to watch, you, you'd have to probably stick with James and Jaden at the present stage. They're both, you know, doing well. They, you know, they're sort of representing not only our gym, they're representing their sponsors and themselves, you know, tenfold. And they're very good role models for the, a lot of the young kids because Jaden helps take the um, teenage class and yep. James and they will do personals and that with people. So, but they get it. I, I really like my guys. I mean, I'm not, look, it's too small of a sport to start thinking about egos and you're going to get a hundred million bucks to fight, mate. You know, we all know what the fight purses are. I don't feel it's going to change any time soon. It, it will eventually, I'm not going to lie, but you know, these guys get out there, talk to your fans and get photos with the kids, whatever. If they want to sign a t-shirt, sign a t-shirt, you know, don't feel like obliged to do it. Do it. Just do it. It's yeah. what, it's what this game's, you know, that and watch you fight, man, you know. And now these guys are starting to get some good sponsors coming on board as well, which is helping alleviate, you know, the training fees, the supplements yeah. that they use, clothing, you know, just little things so they don't have to worry about digging into their own finances and stuff like that. So uh, I think that's where we're starting to grow a little bit. Mm -hmm. in, in not only in the other gyms, but I've seen a lot of uh, fighters it's, it's down your way as well and, and in Melbourne and, and Perth. Everyone's starting to get some good sponsors behind them, uh, helping them out. They just need now to get into the shows a little bit more and sort of working together as some should. And um, once that sort of happens one day, that um, it'll be um, cream for everybody, I feel. And is that kind of um, sort of brand building thing something that you kind of advise fighters on or, or, or that they sort of go about um, it themselves? I no, I, I try to give them uh, a little bit of guiding for because I mean we did it with Aaron and Pixie yeah. and Sarah Zach Roston and Danny Davowski and sort of thing. I mean, you're, you're representing the sport, yeah. you're representing my gym, representing yourself. So do it in a way where people want to come and you know, there's no point being an, an arrogant 
wanker because, uh, you know, we've seen what happens with fighters that do that. You know, the, the diamond doesn't, they don't get light, they get booed, you know. I, I want people to cheer and come to a, a fight yeah. show to a good night. Be entertained by a good sporting uh, package out there. And, you know, for these guys representing your company or your gym, they've got their shirts on and doing all those sorts of things. So that's the only way we can build up a brand and build up a sport. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and kind of, well, I guess a, a question off of that, because you sort of yeah. were training fighters in what a lot of people describe as that golden era of Australian Muay Thai when it was yeah. on TV. Did you find yeah. uh, the platform then kind of made it easier for fighters to to speak with, with brands about getting involved in sponsorship? Is it oh. easier now with social media, harder now? How, how do you find that's changed? No, I, look, it was easy back then because of the TV. If they were on TV, you know, you, the selling tool was you know, they'd write a resume together and say, okay, the, the first viewing platform is usually between fifty to 75,000 people yeah. viewing your company logo on my short. How's that? Well, hang on. People say those sort of things quite uh, easy now. But now with the social media, it's the same sort of thing, but in reverse, I mean, You've got your own social media accounts. How many people, you know, you see all the hashtags underneath, hashtag Muay Thai, hashtag Muay Thai life, to try and get their brand out a little bit further to help their sponsors and so forth. So a lot of the younger fighters, you know, I'm talking teenagers uh, to early 20s, they know how to brand sell themselves with the influencers and stuff like that. And it is working, you know, yeah. and it is getting the brand there and the companies out there. And so the companies, you know, because the Fox Sports scenario has sort of, died down uh, so it's now more uh, live streams and social media accounts so you got to make sure that the content that you put on your social media account is uh, sponsor worthy so mm-hmm. if they look at and think this guy's pretty good look he's got you know 15,000 followers or whatever yeah um, if you've got brand content you know that company might go well hang on, I'll get on board so you know that's how we do it with that with our fighters and you know Again, we're going to bring back war on the shore. So it's the same sort of concept. You know, the TV has gone mm-hmm. now to the, you know, you got to watch some of the, some of these things on social media, especially with eruption um, uh, and rebellion and, um, all, all, you know, all the major players, Epic and all those sorts of things, their social media um, ads for the, for the show itself is to die for. You yeah. wouldn't see that on, on sport. Fox Sport was the same thing over and again. Yeah. again so these things, flames coming out, the five themselves doing work. 24-7, which is like what UFC did. So I think we're now in the, I believe we're in the infancy of that, definitely, and it will grow. And I feel once that starts to grow with more sponsors coming in behind the fighters and then eventually to the fight shows, the promotions will get bigger. And with that comes along, that then obviously the, the fight purses will go up. So I think we're in a, a, on a really, we're in a delicate time. We should be able, if we can capitalise on I think we're going to do really, really well in the next few years because, we, because again, we have got some fantastic fighters in this country again now, and I think that's just you know, you know, say you know, there was a bit of a lull in the probably 2010 through to about 2000, I don't know, 16, 17. There were some good fighters, not now. Now there's a lot of good fighters again, you know, yeah. and that you know from way through to here and you guys and and Victoria and South Australia as well. So yeah. we're on board, and if we can, we can. Enhance it by look again, as I said, looking after the sponsors with the social media platforms and the live streams and so forth, and doing all those little bit extra things. I think we're going to be on a, on a pretty good wicket. Yeah, and that, we've kind of uh, segued well into sort of my next question that I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, War on the Shore yeah. is coming back, so um, I guess just run us through a little bit, uh, sort of you know, why you've decided to, well, I guess, you know, you wanted to bring it back a little bit earlier, but the world's been a little bit funny, but, but um, yeah, well, uh, talk to us about War on the Shore. Mm. Yep, look, it's still a little bit funny, so we're still waiting to hear back from our venue, the casino. Yeah. We feel that there's a lot of promotions going on, um, and to me, there's, you know, like Evolution was the cream of the crop. Absolutely. Um, now we have Eruption, which is the cream of the crop for us up here. But we haven't had anything again for a long time that was been in a classy establishment where you could say to your wife or your girlfriend or your mate, oh, we're going to go to the casino tonight. We're going to have a meal, go and watch the fights and have yeah. a bit of a night out just mm. all in one place. And that's what we want to bring back to the sport. We want to bring, you know, because I've been you know, talking to a few of the guys and everyone says, oh, you know, if you don't want to do it, we can do it here. I said, but mate, no, no we'll, we'll wait. Once the um, restrictions lift, then we can get back in with government restrictions lifted. Uh, we'll do war on the shore. So 
it's definitely happening. It's just going to, hopefully it's July 31, just still waiting to hear back from them. And then if not, then it'll have to be postponed again. But, you know, it's definitely coming back. And as I said, it'll, the casino, a, a classy night out, you'll have to wear a nice shirt and, you know, come to a nice establishment, <laughs> have a good meal, have a few drinks for your wife or girlfriend and, and enjoy yourselves. Oh, yeah. That's the plan. Yeah. <laughs> as you know, because you're on the list. <laughs> no, 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 it's like we're just crossing our face going, yeah, come on, we'll get back up. Yeah, Whenever yeah. it's on, we'll be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so as I said, you know, we want to encompass, you know, because flights are cheap. So, and as I said, I have got some pretty good sponsors on, on board with myself and uh, my partner, Mr. C. So doing all those sorts of things, if we can bring out a really good package of what we used to do and lots of things, people are going to want to come to that package each time, you know, oh, we're going to go to war and shore. So what we're trying to do, some promoters here in Queensland are trying to build a platform that can go from one show to the, you know, they have a few fights and they move to the next level show and then to the next level show yep. from there, you know, and that, that's the plan. And it's to me, I'll still stick to that plan because some of these guys, you know, well, you know, a couple of them I've worked with, you know, for nearly 30 years, you know, like Paul McCauley, I mean, we've known each other for a very, very long time. And, um, you know, look, look at eruption, you know, I mean, it's you know, people go because I don't, yeah, it is, but also because these fighters are good and they bring a crowd to watch them fight on that, you know, or watch her fight on the, on the show as well. So it's um, a, a really good platform, but we still need an, another one that's just going to be that, you know, to the next step as well, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, like, um, with your with your promotion from there, do you, do you have yep. any um, <clears throat> memories of like some um, awesome fights from back in the day that that really stick in your mind? Oh mate, yeah, um, P- Pixie and Soren had probably three of the best fights I've seen. Now you can mm. get, get, have a look at them on uh, YouTube, um, and I'm not going to touch saying them. They were all really really close, you know. Like I think we won two and Soren won one, uh, and but you can just I can sit there and watch them all day. It was good clean quality Muay Thai, uh, Aaron Lee, um, you know, fighting some of the guys that were on um, uh, Explosion and he'd fight some of the Japanese superstars and that were three to five kilos and still knock them out. You know, Danny Dadowski was, you know, Daniel Kerr and then he fought a couple of boys, you know, from all over. So, yeah, look, I, I could give you probably a hundred fights from not only mine, from Evolution, that stick in my mind. Um, you know, and I, I still watch those fights today just to, you know, pick up little things again. Okay, that's right. That's how we did it back then. And, you know, it's just, just little tweaks here and there. You guys probably do the same thing as well. I mean, I watch probably a good five to eight hours of fights a week. Uh, some new, I'm old, just pick up, you know, okay, because so, you know, I look at a certain fighter and say, okay, you're sort of shaped like, say, him, yeah. Superlek, or you're or shape more like, you know, Nongo or something. Okay, we need to sort of give you a little bit more balance like that because if you train everybody the same way in your gym, people get pretty like, okay, they're all going to do this, you know. Mm-hmm. So I look at body shapes and, and as you guys would as well, um, you know, it's more of a science, you know, you work out what they're good at and what they can do and, you know, it, 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 look, I, I love it, man. It's a, I, I can't put any more plans on that. It's something that's going to be until the I die. So yeah. end of story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. I think I think yeah, that comes to the end of the time at the moment from there. Like yeah, so Mark, awesome. Thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> it's been, no, I loved it. It's awesome. Yeah, man, it's like great. I'd love to have you back on as well at some point. As well, like maybe like if, yeah. if, if if your show goes through, we'll get when you get close to the show, we'll get you guys on. You maybe Mister C and talk about the show yeah. coming through would be good. Yeah. <laughs> Look, either way, man. If it comes if it comes together. This year it comes together. If not, we'll get it happening. But um, as I said, it, it's something to look forward to. Yeah. Um, and I, I've had that much response from not only you guys as well, but people in Melbourne and uh, Zambia and WA. Man, come out, have one short back. It's just it's good to hear those sorts of things. It's and it's, as you know, it's why you do it. You know, I want to bring this. I want to bring this platform back for that particular reason to get that next level up. You know, look, it look it may flop. I don't think it will, but. It may, may, it may flop, but if it doesn't, I think it's going to be good and it's going to make, okay, that's, people are going to go, okay, we're going to fight this, but I want to go on war on the shore. So you keep fighting like that, you get on war on the shore. So, yeah. or you get on, you know, Diane to Sydney or you get on Domination or Muay Thai Grand Prix for those degrees because you're on those smaller uh, backyard country gym fight shows and all of a sudden people start to take notice here and then you start looking at those little pathways to get there and that's the good thing. 
Yeah, it is massive for the sport to give the up and coming fighters something to aspire to, which I think for a few years it was kind of missing. One thousand percent, I couldn't agree with that anymore. It's just something that I feel in the last few years, especially in, in our space, has lacked a little bit. But you got Paul McCollum now doing that sort of yeah. thing. But there's still a couple more to get that sort of. You know, you've got the C uh, quality shows, and then C you move to your B, then there's no real A's, you know, other than Paul. So we've got to start building that up a little more because there's more Jews out there, there's more fighters out there. And that's, you know, you've got to educate one, you've got to educate the coaches, you've got to educate the fighters, you've got to educate the promoters to start building this. As a good network, so and it works well, you know. I mean, look at UFC; it sort of, you know, it keeps building and building and building. They got, you know, they do documentaries on the fighters two weeks before in, in their house, what they're eating, how they train, talking to their wife, kissing their kids goodbye. You know, just you get to know the fighter, you know, yeah. and that, they're little things we should start looking at as well, you know, education. You know, so the fight, you know, that fight hops in, someone goes, oh, that's the guy sitting with his wife, kissing his kids. Oh, he's a great guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just things like that. Take yeah. that little bit of a stick. People thinking about that, oh, it's all to do, you know, it's all thugs in, it's not all thugs in Muay Thai, mate, you know, mm. there's a lot of educated people in Muay Thai, you know. Yeah, it's it's important to um to tell the story. I think that's what makes a difference in in promoting a fight. So people will get interested in the fight, but you'll really compel them to watch and b- become invested in the sport by telling them stories. Yeah, hundred percent, guys, hundred percent. Nice, good. So, Mike, if everyone, if anyone wants to get in contact with you or find your gym, where can they find you on social media? Um, we're on Instagram, Strike Force. Um, Gym Australia, um, and we're on Facebook, Strike Force Muay Thai Gym or Strike Force Thai Boxing Gym. There's two of those. One's mine, one's Mr. C's. Um, or you just on the Google or Strike Force um, on there as well, Strike Force Thai Box 4 at Wix.com. So we're all over. So just type it in, you'll find us. Come, Burley Heads, come and have a look and, and see what it's all about. Awesome, awesome, mate. Cool. If you can stick around after we play the intro, mate, that'll be great. Um, but yep. other from us, guys, we'll see you next time, mate. Eh? See ya. All right, bye. Cool, Mark. Thanks for that. Legend. Too smooth. That was awesome, guys. Oh, that's really appreciate it. I forgot to ask the question. No, I've got to ask over Instagram. <laughs> Fuck, I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> There was just one question. Let me see. I'll, I'll just pick it up from there. It was um Dylan's and Eddie. Dylan's and Eddie said, "How did you get, how did you get so smooth?" <laughs> Somebody had to ask it. Uh, look, I mean, I was not, it was a fight name that was given to me. At, at a, I used to go Tim Fisher, as you all know, who owned yeah. Six on Canal so in, in time. We used to club quite a lot together up here in the Gold Coast. And we used to go dancing at the clubs and all sort of stuff. And I mean, just just. Chick called me and she goes, you're so smooth on the dance floor. You're just too smooth. And I thought, I just stuck in my head. So that's how, that's how that event started to my, <laughs> see my fight name. Aaron Lee was just, Aaron Lee got too smooth too for the same reason. He could, he could dance, he could do anything. Oh. He was just too smooth on the level. <laughs> I love that. Fair enough. Good. At least I'm still recording, so I, still, I, can, put that, <laughs> I can put that in somewhere. <laughs>